Hello and welcome to the Karate Priest Podcast. I'm your host, Father Daniel Duplantis. I'm a martial artist, musician, airman, and a priest of the Diocese of Homa Thibodeau. One of my other passions in life is teaching, especially teaching about the Catholic faith. Catholicism is a very deep faith. Jesus himself told Peter to put out into the deep for a catch. The most significant answers to life's most important questions often lie deep beneath the surface. Many people have questions about their faith. Through this podcast, my aim is to explore these questions and encounter incredible people along the way. Their stories show that God is constantly at work in our lives every single day, sometimes in the ordinary and sometimes in the extraordinary. Some of the topics treated in this podcast may be sensitive or controversial, but their discussion holds the key to truly living as God created us to live, which is to say that he created us to live in authentic freedom, loving him above all else. Thank you for joining me on this journey of faith. And I hope you enjoy this podcast. Hello, and welcome back to the Karate Priest Podcast. I am your host, Father Dan DePlanis. And uh, today I'm joined uh, by two familiar guests. We have my producer, uh, Todd Fisher and Amber Rose, the religious hippie. Uh, we're going to be talking about gratitude today. But before that, we've had some really exciting things happening for all of us. And uh, um, it's been really cool. Um, we've had several podcasts we're really just kind of taken off recently. And uh, um, i like to plug some of these in. So Todd has the, uh, the Quest podcast. Amber has her own, A Catholic's Perspective. Um, and then uh, I was recently a guest on No Earthly Explanation. And we did uh, are really uh, probably the, the longest interview I've done in like an hour and a half talking about a Catholic perspective of all things unknown. Um, so it was a really fun episode to do. We talked about like demonic and things like that, um, different, you know, natural, uh, you know, unexplained supernatural phenomena, the church's position on those things. Uh, and so, and then Amber also, Amber just went to Colorado uh, for a conference. Uh, Amber, can you tell us a bit about what you just did in Colorado? Yeah, of course. It was, well, thank you for having me back on, by the way, Father Dan. Um, but yeah, I just got back a couple of days ago from a conference out in Colorado where I was speaking. It's called SOCA, um, Souls of the uh, Christian Apostolate. It's really good. You can look it up online just by typing in Souls of the Christian Apostolate. Anyways, um, it was amazing. It was my first time flying, so that was exciting. Everybody was just like, you'll be fine, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. And of course, you know, I always have to prepare myself for the worst. So I was like, nothing's gonna be fine. They're gonna throw me in jail. Something's gonna happen. I got through TSA and I checked all my bags within 15 minutes. Nobody helped me. I was literally just like, oh, I feel like I've done this a million times. Um, plane ride was good. And then I got there, I was picked up by Anthony um not my manager anthony different anthony and i got to see a little bit of colorado and honestly the conference itself was just so wonderful i got to meet up with my manager anthony who lives in colorado we got to go sightseeing um i got to speak to about 220 young adults and just interact with them and really get to know them um i really love the community out there it's completely different from the community i have here uh the people are just so sweet and um very welcoming. It's very homey, you know? Uh, so I've been telling Todd, I'm like, I want to move there. And Todd's like, don't, don't plant your roots in the first place you go. And I'm like, okay, that's fair. But you still. haven't visited Louisiana yet. So yeah, I would agree with Todd's statement. Yeah. We always say there's no place like Homa. <laughs> wow. I will have to visit. Hopefully this year in September, I'll come down or something or we'll do oh, yeah. something. Sweet. But uh, overall, it was really amazing. I got to share my own testimony and um, my own story with tradition and how the traditional Latin mass really brought me back into my faith. And I attend both, you know, I go to Novus Ordo and TLM, but I was raised in the TLM. So it was kind of going back to my roots, which really helped me kind of embrace uh, my Catholicism. And from there, I met amazing people. A lot of great people came to the conference, People, other people who were speaking like Bishop Strickland and Father Nolan, I got to meet. And, you know, I had dinner with Bishop Strickland and I told him about all the crazy things that are happening in the Chicago Archdiocese with 
the Institute of Christ the King being shut down and then the persecution of traditional Catholics under our leadership. Um, and so it's been like really, really good though, honestly, that I'm able to connect with people who truly understand and are really supportive of um, just, you know, young people really getting out into, into the world and talking about Catholicism and their own stories. That's awesome. You have a kind of uh, opposite upbringing that I do because I grew up in the Norvis Ordo exclusively. I didn't attend right. my first uh, Latin mass until um, I think my first year of college seminary. Right. Um, so, and I, I remember going to my first Latin mass and I was, I was like, what on earth is this? Um, <laughs> like, I remember, it's funny because I remember going to Mother Angelica's shrine um, that same first year of seminary. And when I was there, I saw they had a book called How to Serve. It was a manual for all servers. And I'm reading some of these things and I'm like, what is a subdeacon? <laughs> like, what is a pontifical high mass? Like, like none of these diagrams make any sense. Um, and I'm like, what is going on in this book? So, and, it, and then I finally go to a Latin mass in New Orleans for the first time. And I just feel so lost. I was, I was like, what is happening here? Like, it's not just that it's in Latin, which I had a pretty decent grasp of by that time. Um, for me, it was like, I don't understand the order of things. It wasn't until, you know, I got deeper into my liturgical studies to realize that both masses really are, are very parallel. And it was just, you know, uh, uh, naming things differently. Mm -hmm. You know, what we would call like the secret uh, in the Latin mass is the, uh, what we call the, um, the offertory prayer, you know, right. or the prayer over the, uh, over the gifts, you know. So to realize that that's the same thing, like the structure of prayer is, is essentially the same. Um, and so, uh, but yeah, like I remember growing up, you know, and, and being born in the mid nineties, you know, we still had like a lingering of like some of the, 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 I guess you could say the culture that had really kind of taken root in the seventies and the eighties. Um, and, uh, and, and just kind of seeing that that has, you know, at least in my diocese has really died, um, that, you know, at least with, with priests that we've seen being ordained recently, um, you know, we're, we're really going to a very strict interpretation of, uh, of Vatican II and Sacrosanctum Concilium, especially, you know, so. Um, no, for sure. Yeah, and, and I now I celebrate both. I celebrate both masses now, and so now it's it's amazing to see, you know, um, like where we came from, where we are now, and you know, and trying to piece all this together. And so, uh, yeah. No, for sure, because I remember you saying when you started saying the TLM, and you were like, you have to practice, and um, it can be really difficult. But I honestly like really enjoyed it. And while I was in Colorado, I got to go to a TLM parish out there. Um, and it was really great. I got to meet a lot of different people and a lot of different priests who are just, I just love meeting a bunch of different Catholic people. And, um, oh, and also, so my rosaries are going live. So I made limited edition religious hippie rosaries. They should Sweet. be going live soon if they are not already live when this podcast goes out on my website at the religious I am so excited for these. I mean, they're just, ugh. I love them so much. I've been taking pictures with my rosary like everywhere. I'm like, oh my gosh, it traveled with me. Look, here it is in Colorado and here it yep, is. Yeah, I've seen the pictures church. and it looks absolutely dope. It's uh, so fun. Like, it, it's great. It slaps it, you know, whatever terminology it's on fleek. That's what we used like <laughs> 10 years ago when I was in high school. So like, yeah, whatever terminology you want to use, it looks great. Thank um, you. So for our listeners, go find that, check out her website. Um, so anywho, I want to get into today's topic, which uh, Todd actually suggested we talk about, which is gratitude. Um, you know, and gratitude, we, we could say is a virtue, you know, it's something that definitely requires practice. You know, if we look at virtues at being, um, holy habits is how I like to describe it because a, a virtue is something that has to be cultivated. Uh, it's a habit that has to be instilled, whereas a vice would be a bad habit. And so gratitude is always something that it really goes a long way. I find it's a virtue that people will remember you for if you're grateful versus if you're ungrateful. Uh, so Todd, do you have any kind of just remarks with that as far as, you know, uh, why, why are we talking about gratitude today? Well, I find uh, gratitude really interesting in a, in a couple levels. Um, certainly, uh, you know, you mentioned gratitude is a virtue, you know, gratitude is a very, you know, there definitely falls in a religious category, but from a psychological perspective, I find the term gratitude really interesting. Um, and, you know, I host, um, I host a podcast called Cult Following with Dr. Katie Mooney, who's a psychologist. And we, uh, in that podcast, we talk about, we basically analyze 
what makes a cult? What are the ingredients that actually make one? What's the psychology of the leader of a cult? What's the psychology of people that attend them? And that's what that podcast is about. And Dr. Katie would always mention about, uh, in just kind of our side conversation, she would mention gratitude and how when you see a patient, one of the first questions a psychologist will ask is whether they're grateful for anything because they can kind of get a kind of a, a benchmark because if they're grateful, they're on a path to healing versus people that aren't grateful. And I always thought it was a really interesting topic from both a psychological perspective and a religious perspective. And I thought maybe we could kind of dial into this a little bit more because I think there are a lot of people out there just in the regular world that think of gratitude as maybe just saying grace at dinner. And it's actually far beyond that. So um, I thought maybe you could mention what's, what's really the first biblical reference of gratitude or saying grace. So that would be a good way to kind of kick this off on the religious end. And then where I kind of really wanted to pick up with is whether gratitude, we can really break it down to whether it's an emotion or it's a mindset or maybe exactly what it is. What is it we're feeling when we are grateful? Yeah. I, so biblically, this goes back as far as Genesis. And I think probably one of the earliest examples we have of uh, any kind of like really saying gratitude, or we would even say, like, you know, praying grace before a meal or anything, uh, is with the appearance of Melchizedek, the high priest of Salem. Uh, and what we see Melchizedek do is he offers, he says, a blessing over bread and wine. Um, and he offers that. And so uh, right there is kind of the beginnings of what we see as any kind of like praying some kind of grace over meals. Uh, and then that kind of unfolds throughout, you know, uh, Ju uh, Judaism. Uh, even up to the time of Christ. And I thought it was really interesting in the TV series, The Chosen, uh, which I highly recommend anybody watch. You could get the app for free. Um, it's, it's, you don't have to even buy this. You can get the app for free. You can watch it. They have two seasons out right now. They're filming season three right now. And uh, what I love about The Chosen is the way that they portray Jesus actually like celebrating grace before meals. Anytime you see him sit down to eat or any of the Jews, um, you know, what, what I love about the chosen is how it captures the Jewishness of Jesus and the apostles. Um, and so when you see, when they sit down to eat, you, you see Jesus pick up the bread or the wine and say, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, um, Lord of heaven and earth, you know, and he actually, which is a prayer that we've kind of adopted into our celebration of the mass, you know, so what happens is uh, that kind of original prayer of Melchizedek, who first offers grace over bread and wine, you know, we see that tradition continue through Christ. Um, has made its way into the mass because what happens is at the offertory, the first thing the priest does at, at, at the offertory, and this is the same thing for both the Latin mass and for the Norvis Ordo, is that the priest takes the patent of bread and he offers this prayer. He says, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you. Fruit of the earth and work of human hands will become for us the bread of life. And he says a similar prayer over the chalice as well. Um, and so like saying grace is not just something before a regular meal. It's also a liturgical practice um, where we actually celebrate that in the liturgy. And the, the prayer that most Catholics know as the prayer of grace before meals is the actual like prescribed prayer of blessing. If you look in the book of blessings in the order itself, that is the prayer of blessings. Usually like the actual right for grace before meals um, incorporate some kind of scripture reading, a response, a homily can be given for any of these blessings, but there's a whole longer rite of blessing, but like the actual prayer of blessing is the one that pretty much every single practicing Catholic knows that they say before they, they celebrate meals. So that's at least like the kind of like the biblical, in the end brief, the biblical history of it, how it's kind of got, it got to Christ and how we even celebrate it in the liturgy today. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, is gratitude a practice you should do every day? Like how, what would you, what would be an example of maybe how you can build a better pattern of doing this? What are some examples of showing everyday gratitude? Yeah. So this is something that I actually incorporate when I'm hearing confessions. Um, what happens is if I have people who are struggling with things like despair, you know, um, and, and especially just like, you know, maybe just seeing a lot of negativity, seeing the glass half empty, um, and, and what I try to do is encourage them to practice, um, I, I call this more like the umbrella virtue under which I think gratitude is, is a smaller virtue, and that's the virtue of hope. You know, I try to get them to see things more positively, because if we're grateful for things, it, it helps us to be hopeful. You know, I think when it comes to the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, 
faith and charity tend to be very practical and people kind of know what those things look like. People are always like, how do I, how do I concretely practice hope? And so with that, I tell them probably one of the easiest ways to concretely practice and make a virtue in a habit out of hope is to make a virtue and a habit out of gratitude. So I'll tell them in confession, if they start, you know, if they have trouble with despair or have trouble with hope, you know, I'll tell them for your penance, what I want you to do is before you go to bed tonight is I want you to list and actually maybe write these things down at least three blessings in your life right now. What are the three things you are most thankful for? And I guarantee there's at least three. You know, I said, do that for your penance. I said, and guess what? If you can do that every single day, like maybe like have like a, like a, a blessings journal where you're writing down every day, three things that you're grateful for that particular day, you know, imagine like, you know, three blessings a day. So like seven days a week, that's 21 blessings in a week, 365 days a year. You're talking about, you know, over a thousand blessings in a year that you can go back and read through. You know, so it helps people to see how God is moving in their lives, you know. Um, so that's especially how I would encourage people to practice that virtue of gratitude um, is to just every single day before you go to bed, say thank you for something. You know, thank you for the fact that you woke up this morning. That's the first prayer you should say when you wake up. Lord, thank you for letting me see another day, you know. Um, and oftentimes, even in the liturgy of the hours, um, you know, that, that priest pray, that religious pray, um, any lay person can pray usually especially the daytime hours, so like mid-morning, mid-day, mid-afternoon prayer, um, we'll focus on like thanking God for the work that we have started or are undergoing or have completed uh, and giving thanks for the work that we've completed throughout the day. So especially that midday office, uh, the, the daytime office is really about praying and, and being grateful for the work we have completed uh, throughout the course of that day. My uh, routine, very similar to what you said, you know, my, I, I'm grateful for things at night, my evening before I go to sleep prayers. However, when the alarm goes off in the morning, I'm not so much, thank you for letting me wake up as much as it's like, why is the alarm going off? You know, yeah. <laughs> I get more of that, but I do my mornings. So I don't usually do anything before noon because I always reserve two hours in the morning for my coffee and my contemplation yeah. is what I do. And then there's no business in that time. And then I plug in at noon. You guys know that. I don't ever schedule anything. You also before. never you know, sleep, Todd. I also, yeah, I yeah. seldom <laughs> really sleep. You know, I'm there's a Todd coffee Todd. mug that says my morning begins with coffee and contemplation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. 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 It's a common, it's a, like a pretty ordinary thing, I think people think. But I actually do it. Yeah. I know it's, it's not written on a coffee mug. That's how I get my brain going for the day because I, I require to think so much during the day. I've got to kind of like, prime it you know it's kind of yeah. crazy but i am very lax on saying grace at a meal like i like it I, it's not often because i'm a gas and go kind of guy i just right. you know it's a it's quick soup and i go and i often am forgetting to say grace so that's my my flaw there but uh amber what do you do to practice gratitude uh i usually keep a gratitude journal um oh. i usually and the first thing in the morning when i wake up my my cat will wake me up by like needing me you know how he like you know they take their claws and they just like need you like dough um he'll do that so then that wakes me up because he usually wakes me up around seven and then i'll usually just like kind of sit in bed and read my imitation of christ i'll get my coffee um i'll kind of look over my examination of conscience from the nice night the, the night before that i did and I'll kind of like think to myself, like, okay, you know, what do I need to improve on today? Because while I do it at night, like the night before, I find that by morning, sometimes I'll forget what I contemplated because I'm so tired. Um, so I kind of skim through it again really quick just to see like, okay, you know, I need to practice patience a little more. I need to work on this. Um, and then from there, I kind of just start my day. I do my Divine Mercy Chapel at 3 p.m. And then at night, you know, um, I do my rosary. But I do try to do grace as often as I can. Like, like Todd though, sometimes if I'm out and about, I will forget because it's, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, grab Chipotle. Okay. On my way to like, you know, this next event or this or that it happened a lot in Soka. And honestly, I'm very thankful for the people I was with in Soka because it was so ingrained in them. That was that because I was around them, even if we were doing a quick, you know, meal or something, somebody would always be like, wait, Grace, you know, they would always remind us like, oh, wait, Grace. So it was really great being around that community, being able to really, um, 
you know, trust other Catholics that if we forgot something, somebody wouldn't, you know, so that was really great. Yeah, as a follow up to, to as a couple of really just great things I love in what you just said. One of them is like you said, like at, at Soka, how like people would stop and say, wait, we got to say grace, mm-hmm. you know, um, it's funny, we actually do that like at Taekwondo, where I train because like what we do is every other Friday, we have black belt training and it's just for the black belts for us to do like our advanced techniques, but like pretty much all the black belts at my school are practicing Catholics. And so when we all go out to eat, it's like a dozen of us. It looks like we're like Jesus and the 12 apostles because <laughs> it's, 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 you know, we have, you know, like the little core group of Catholic black belts who come eat. And then like some of the parents come too. And it's funny because everybody knows, like we don't start digging in until we say grace. And it's funny. We've had to stop each other sometimes because like, I guess sometimes we just forget. And like, I remember one of our poor guys, Rumsey, he had like a whole chicken tender stuck in his mouth and we're like, all right, let us pray. And he's like, you know, like sheepishly like looking down and swallowing his chicken tender and, you know, and um, Mm -hmm. so yeah, it's, but like, we make sure to do that, you know? And then um, uh, the one thing I love that you said too, is you, you mentioned your like examine, you know, your daily examine. Um, which is such an important practice. It's something that St. Ignatius of Loyola recommended all the time. And that's part of it. You can do examines focused on different things. In fact, actually, there's a really cool app that I have on my phone called Reimagining the Examine. And what it does is it gives you several different examines uh, you can go through based on different topics. And so like, you know, pulling it up, they have like, you know, am I free or unfree? Ask for grace, a relationship, uncovering hidden truths. One of them on here is, gratitude. Hmm. And so, you know, you can find these examines where it asks specific questions for your meditation. And what's really cool about the examine is that it's actually built into the liturgy of the hours every single day in the office of night prayer. Awesome. So what happens is for night prayer, it's the last office of the day. And so, you know, what happens is you start with an examination of conscience. Now, in usually in communal celebration, it's very, very brief. It's almost like it would be for mass when you do the confidior. Um, but for like individual celebration of the office, um, like that's where we're encouraged to take the time to do like, like a, a long examine to actually look over our whole day, you know, and ask ourselves the question St. Ignatius wants us to answer, like, where, would, where do we feel God moving? You know, uh, where do we feel like we encountered God throughout the day? Uh, what are we struggling with? What are we thankful for? All those questions. There's so many things that, and that's why there's so many different examines you can go with just to kind of focus it a little bit more. But on that particular app, one of them is gratitude. I'm low key just going to look that up really quick. It's fantastic. I love it. I mean, it's definitely helping me with my exam. And, you know, like I said, when I do night prayer, because I'm obligated to do night prayer. Um, and so it's a great way, like, to look back at the day. Um, and then, like you said, if you have a journal that you do that with, that's fantastic. Because you write down your examines, write down specifically, where'd you feel God moving? What are you thankful for? What broke your heart today? You know, all those things. So you can look back at that and you can kind of see more of a trajectory of like where your life is heading right now, spiritually even. So I think that's it. It looks like it. Yep. Okay, perfect. Yeah, this looks really cool. It's awesome. I'll check it out afterwards. But yeah, no, that looks awesome. Great. Cool. Is a is a person really only grateful for um you know good things, or are you grateful for times when you're grieving and things like that? Is being grateful just really for good things? It's when the Catholic side comes into things, because I think as Anyone? Catholics, we can definitely look at things from a different perspective. Wait, did we just glitch? Yeah, my computer froze. So like, <laughs> Holly, can you ask that question again? Yeah, I just I just asked. Um, I know you have a storm in your area, so I thought, oh, his power just went out. <laughs> it just it, my computer just said your Internet connection is unstable. Uh, oh. Um. Well, that's better than it's saying your mental health is unstable, right? (laughs) When Zoom tells you that one day, you know. Oh, man. Um, No, uh, I was asking, you know, are people generally just grateful for good things or can you be uh, grateful for other experiences like grief or things like that? Yeah, I think you can be. And and oftentimes what happens is not immediately in the moment. Um, It's very difficult in the moment of grief or hardship to be thankful for that thing happening right then and there. Um, because you have to go through a grieving process. Um, honestly, just kind of thinking through the different stages of grieving, um, I, I think that the gratitude is really going to come in towards the end of the process, which is acceptance. Um, you know, you're going to go through um, like the uh, 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 disbelief, you're going to go through the anger, the bargaining, um, 
the depression phases. And so, but usually it's when you get around to accepting the fact that this happened, that you can look back and then start asking, you know, what did I learn from this? What can I do going forward? You know, and you begin to, at that point, begin to be grateful for, um, you know, the hardships. And this is, you know, I think, uh, you know, we're like good, like counseling psychologically, or even just good spiritual direction is helpful uh, because a good spiritual director will help you to look at hardships in your life and then ask you, you know, what did you learn from that? Are you grateful in any way for those things happening? So it is absolutely possible. I think it's a lot of time that, be, that that's part of the process. It's not going to happen immediately, but absolutely. I'll look back on my life now and look at, 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 you know, some of the most difficult moments for me, either as a priest or even before. And I'm grateful for how, you know, things happen um, because it, it really shaped the trajectory that made me realize that God can ride straight with my crooked lines. So, yeah. I want to source something here. So the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, this is the book that psychiatrists, psychologists follow. <clears throat> they define gratitude like this. Gratitude is a human emotion that can most simply be defined as appreciation or acknowledgement of a selfless act. Wow. Now there's plenty more about gratitude, but this is the, the brief summary. I think it's interesting that gratitude in the DSM-5 is defined as an emotion. Would you call gratitude an emotion? I would say that it can be partially an emotion, but at the same time, I would say it is a virtue. You can actually practice gratitude. It's the same thing with love. You know, we say that there's, there's, there's a, there certainly is an emotional aspect to love. Honestly, what I would call the emotion associated with love, I would call that affection, right? Um, I would call that, 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 that's what I'll call the emotion, like either, either affection as the emotion uh, or perhaps infatuation, you know, in, in a certain sense as well. And maybe that's more of the, the erotic sense as opposed to, you know, affection being more of the agape sense, um, if we're talking about the, like the classic Greek loves. Um, but when it comes to gratitude, I don't think, I, 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 we, I don't think we could put it in a box and say it's just an emotion. Again, I think it is a virtue. Um, and the reason I say that as well is because, you know, uh, when you look at like the highest form of worship we have in the church as the celebration of the mass, you know, we call it the celebration of the Eucharist. Eucharist is Greek for Thanksgiving. The entire celebration of the Eucharist is an act of Thanksgiving. It's not an emotion. The mass is not an emotion. The mass is an act, the highest act of thanksgiving and it's saying thank you it's the highest act of thanksgiving saying thank you for the highest act of selflessness which is the sacrifice of christ so how fitting i mean in a way that definition is very fitting except that you're right it, i i don't think we could put it in the box of an emotion but certainly the rest of it sounds great because the highest form of thanksgiving we can do on this side of heaven is to give thanks through the mass for the the, the ultimate act of selflessness that was given by christ and I think that's the psychology world for you is they try to box things in. They try to you know, segment and compartmentalize and create everything that they can like that. Um, so it makes sense, I guess, for them. Um, but it is interesting of whether it is, you know, whether it is an emotion or a feeling or a virtue is, uh, I guess it's subject to a lot of interpretation there, I suppose. Um, yeah. Well, I wonder, so what do you think, what do you think of a person who, can't find anything to be grateful for or is ungrateful what are we dealing with when we have a person like that wow and is there a difference between someone who can't find anything to be grateful for versus someone just being ungrateful is there a difference in that person yeah i'll start with that i think there certainly is a difference because i i think you know partially what happens there is you have people who um maybe just are at, at you know in in such a state of maybe spiritual desolation that they, they're having just a hard time, even in prayer, to be grateful for things, you know. Um, I don't think it's that they're ungrateful. I think maybe they're just having a hard time seeing beyond um, pain, seeing beyond desolation, seeing beyond darkness, you know, in their lives. Um, I think certainly most, a lot of the saints have struggled with that, you know, that there would be times where they struggled, at least, to find things to be grateful for, or even just in terms of, like, the emotions, you know. And I think of, like, the, the wording of the Psalms, you know, um, especially, like, Psalm 88, you know, which, which is a very dark psalm, um, you know, and you could maybe imagine that the psalm writer is having a very difficult time to find things to be hopeful about, to be grateful about. I do think that's different from somebody who is ungrateful, 
somebody who just maybe out of the way they were raised, you know, maybe, maybe nothing psychologically wrong with them, not like from a pathological sense, but simply by their upbringing or, or things like that, that they just become very ungrateful. I think of like Scrooge, you know, <laughs> you know, when you look at like, like the, um, what, what, oh, what's that tale that Scrooge is in? Um, the ghost Carol. of Christmas past, right? Christmas Isn't it the Carol. ghost of Christmas past? Yeah. I think the movie might be called a Christmas Carol, but I think the story is called the ghost of Christmas past or something. Maybe it is a I Christmas Carol. I don't know. Oh, no. One of the ghosts is the ghost of Christmas Pat. Yeah, you're right. So it is a Christmas Carol. Um, the character of Scrooge, right? Ebenezer Scrooge. The idea with him is that I don't think he has a problem with trying to be grateful for things. I mean, or, or like, 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 like looking for things to be grateful for. I think there's just a great lacking in capacity. I think that's the difference there. I think the difference between those two things, if I had to really distinguish, is that on one, one level, there is a capacity to be grateful but it's hard to exercise that capacity, maybe like, again, because of things like the spiritual state of the soul or something like that. Whereas in the other sense, being ungrateful, I think is lacking the capacity to be grateful. And so that's, I think, how I would distinguish that. Like when you look at somebody like Scrooge, certainly seems he is lacking in the capacity to be grateful, as opposed to he has the ability to do it. It's just that he's having a difficult time because of his certain circumstances at the time. Right. No, it makes sense. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, I don't think I have anything else I want to cover with this. Um, I think we hit a lot of points here. Any last words for people, little tips or advice on being grateful and starting a practice tomorrow? Yeah, uh, I think this is a really simple one. And I think this is something that, uh, that can apply to pretty much anyone who's you know old enough to listen to and understand this podcast. My mom said this, our rectors in the seminary always said this, write thank you notes. It's a very simple practice, uh, you know, especially if somebody gives you gifts. Uh, if you're graduating from school, somebody gives you a gift, write a thank you note. Somebody takes you out to dinner. We were told this all the time in the seminary, you know, a parishioner or somebody, a donor, a benefactor takes you out to dinner, write a thank you note. Your Knights of Columbus Council, you know, sponsors you, gives you a scholarship or something, you know, send a thank you note. Um, it's a very simple way to practice gratitude. And for the person receiving the thank you, it makes them realize, wow, like my gift really was appreciated. Um, and I think that's really how, you know, gratitude also goes in hand in hand with generosity. So write those thank you notes. Perfect. Excellent. Well, great talk today, Father Dan. You want to take it out? Absolutely. Yes. So once again, thank you guys for joining us again with me today is Todd. You can find him on Instagram and Facebook as Todd Fisher. His podcast is The Quest with Todd Fisher. And then also Amber Schneider, the religious hippie. You can find her on anything, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, as the religious hippie. Uh, go check out her website. Amber, can you tell us that website again, especially to look at your rosaries? Yes, it'll be thereligioushippie.com. Hippie is spelled H-I-P-P-I-E. Um, and you can find me on any social media platform under the religious hippie. Great. And I am Father Daniel Duplantis, a.k.a. The Karate Priest. And you can find me at Facebook and Instagram under The Karate Priest. And any questions you want to email me, either message me through those platforms or you can also email me at thekaratepriest at gmail.com. That concludes our time for today. So thank you for joining us and we will see you next time. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of The Karate Priest. If you enjoyed this podcast, go ahead and like The Karate Priest on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you're ever in South Louisiana, come visit me at the Cathedral of St. Francis de Sales in Homa. If you have any questions or comments about the show, you can also email me at thekaratepriest at gmail.com. Your questions are welcomed and may be used in future episodes. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. Amen. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please be sure to rate and review this episode. This podcast is produced by Todd Fisher and distributed by Metacortex Publishing. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Information and opinions stated in this podcast should not be construed as medical advice. Please be sure to visit the official website for the International Association of Metatomics at metatomics.org or find us on social media for other unique content.